Welcome back. On the sunny afternoon of March 4th, 1936, the hard-working ground crew gently guided the LZ-129 out of its construction shed for the very first time. A curious and excited crowd gathered to capture a glimpse of the brand new pride of Friedrichshafen, soon to be the pride of Germany. The skilled ground crew, mostly dedicated employees of the Luftschiffbau, Zeppelin, carefully maneuvered the massive airship onto the field. Everyone from the talented construction crew, the fabrication crew, and even the diligent office clerks from the LZ held on to LZ 129's handling ropes to guide it. First, the majestic 150 foot high tail fins proudly displaying the swastika emblem. Next came the engine cars, followed by the observation windows on the passenger deck, adorned with the iconic Olympic rings. And there it was, the control car leading the way, followed by the airship's elegantly curved blunt nose bow, still awaiting for its name to be painted on it. Although sailors and airship crew considered it a bad sign to sail a ship without a name, the LZ-129 renamed unnamed during its first descent. The name Hindenburg had been chosen earlier. Still, delays in the ship's final construction phases left insufficient time to apply the final coats of dope to the outer cover before its initial test flights. Now, dope is just plasticized lacquer that's used to cover fabric on airships. It was expected that the name Hindenburg would be applied to the front of the ship and that an official ceremony would occur between the first test flights and LZ 129's first round trip journey to South America. The new airship was effortlessly lifted into the sky. The short test flight of a few hours allowed the airship's operators to become familiar with their new responsibilities. Once the airship reached an altitude of 200 to 300 feet, the commander ordered the engines to start. As the four diesel engines roared to life, LZ-129 began moving forward. Some of the crowd gasped as what seemed to be smoke billowing out from its path. Luckily, the dust was accumulated on the hull while it was in the ship's construction shed. As the LZ gracefully circled the airfield before gliding over the scenic Lake Constance, as the sun began to set, it made its gentle descent and smoothly landed at the airfield after an impressive three and a half hours in the air. The crew could not have been happier with the flight. The airship handled beautifully, and the new LOF-6 engines exceeded expectations, impressing everyone with their quietness and minimal vibration. After this, the crew felt confident that the upcoming airworthiness flight trials would be a breeze. And they were. The next day, the LZ-129 embarked on its second test flight, carrying out speed and maneuverability trials for the esteemed, excuse my pronunciation, Deutsche Veluschenstadt für Luftfahrt, the DVL the government agency responsible for granting airworthiness certificates. Meanwhile, the dedicated kitchen and steward staff proudly served their first onboard meals, while maintenance and navigation crews maintained their regular watch rotation as LZ-129 triumphantly circled over the picturesque cities of Munich and Augsburg in Bavaria. After an impressive flight of nearly eight hours, the new airship safely touched down. Over the following weeks, LZ-129 completed five more trial flights, effortlessly passing its speed and maneuverability tests, ultimately obtaining its well-deserved official airworthiness certificate from the DVL. So what exactly happened to this airship? Let's take a deeper look inside. The Hindenburg is also known as a dirigible, and it was a dream sculpted in aluminum, skin wrapped in cotton, luxury, and separated hydrogen gas bags. The Hindenburg was a giant German airship, officially designed as the LZ-129 Hindenburg. When it was constructed, it was named after Paul von Hindenburg, the president of Germany at the time. Crafted in 1936 by the renowned Zeppelin company in Germany, it reigned as a jewel atop the crown of the world's pioneering airline. The Hindenburg stretched to a staggering 245 meters. Now to put this into perspective, it's roughly two and a quarter football fields long. That's crazy. The airship held 97 souls and flew through the boundless skies at a grueling 80 miles per hour. It was famous for its luxury and innovation, and for $450, you could use the Hindenburg's public rooms, private sleeping cabins, and spacious promenades on two decks, dining at the restaurant, hitting the lounge, and even having a cocktail at the bar. 
And when you're all done, you can go and enjoy a smoke at the smoking room. Yeah, there was a smoking room. And it was sealed and pressurized for safety, as were the 25 bunk bed sleeping cabins, as stewardesses would grace the passengers along with the luxurious accommodations. And to top it off, it was only a three days travel across the Atlantic, slashing any ocean liner's pace in half. At this time, the Hindenburg made a staggering 60 flights before its final embarkment on May 3rd, including 10 trips to the US and seven to Brazil. And remember, the airship has to go back as well. Quite an impressive feat, seeing as these flights were roughly 80 to 100 hours in the air. It's crazy. Departing from Friedrichshafen, Germany on May 3rd, the Hindenburg gently soared the Atlantic, aiming for a safe arrival in New Jersey. As it softly descended toward the mooring mass at Lakehurst Naval Air Station, thunderstorms were beginning to brew. Down below, rain poured over the bushy-eyed audience on land, still waving and cheering in anticipation as the Hindenburg waited for the rain and lightning to stop. All the Hindenburg could do was circle around due to the thunderstorms. A passenger aboard the Hindenburg became highly distressed due to the uncertainty of arrival. I wonder why, but we'll talk more on that passenger later. But there was no need to fear. The Hindenburg and other airships like the LZ-129 had endured grueling weather in the past, and many of the airship had been seen being struck by lightning. This was a cakewalk for the crew, and thus painting a prosperous portrait of a future full of wonder. And yet, on 7.25 p.m. of May 6, 1937, it all burned down. It burst under flames. Get it started. Get it started. It's fighting and it's rising. It's rising terrible. Oh my, get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks that leave this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, the humanity. In a mere 34 seconds, the airship was swallowed whole. 62 souls among the 97 on board broke free from its fiery embrace and made it out to safety. The calamity echoed across the Atlantic, and devastation reached the chambers of American and German councils alike. Both the American and German governments did their investigations, and they both came to the same conclusion, that the disaster, a spark of bad luck, was static electricity that caused the fire due to a hydrogen leak. Now, both countries were pretty eager to swiftly resolve this Hindenburg incident and move on because in 1937, international relations were a bit tense. Hitler's Nazi party had taken control of Germany and the world was on the brink of World War II. And I can see why people would think that. For one, the airship had come to symbolize the Nazi party, Adolf Hitler had personally financed the construction of the airship, and he even made sure it bore the emblems of Nazi power. Its fins paraded the symbol of their dominion and pride, swastikas. It's a grim testament to the frail empires built on foundations of oppression. Even rumors started circulating that the Gestapo had mentioned a particular threat to the airship just before takeoff, prompting the presence of undercover intelligence officers to safeguard passengers from possible saboteurs. The Zeppelin company, who crafted the airship, was always paying close attention to safety to ensure successful travels, leading to an outstanding safety history. Even through hydrogen, used in the Hindenburg can be hazardous when adequately sealed in the air, the hydrogen shouldn't have any way of catching fire. The safety measure is a technique that the Zeppelin company has successfully implemented for many years without incident. Over nearly three decades of operations, the safety and well-being of every passenger aboard any of the Zeppelin's airships have been a top priority, with no fatalities or injuries reported. This highlights the effectiveness of their safety protocols. So picture this, over a dozen photographers and cameramen were at Lakehurst when the Hindenburg met its demise. They diligently documented the disaster through incredible photographs and films, which we can see here. So how is that possible that not one of these photographers or cameramen captured that static electricity that was said to have caused the explosion? Q, Commander Max Press. So Press eventually assumed command of the Hindenburg, serving as its captain for very significant voyages. Notably, he helmed the transatlantic flight from Lakehurst to Frankfurt between September 30th and October 3rd, 1936. And the Hindenburg's final three South American crossings, finishing the 1936 season. 
he had successfully navigated airships through thunderstorms and even witnessed the Hindenburg being struck by lightning. Though throughout his life, Press remained firm in his belief that the Hindenburg disaster resulted from sabotage. In a 1960 interview, he adamantly dismissed that the electrical discharge could have caused the accident. He argued that the Zeppelin had safely navigated thunderstorms and even encountered lightning on multiple occasions without incident. Considering Press was at the helm, he greeted much of the passengers, and by meeting them, he had much to say about a few passengers, which we'll get into a bit later. Commander Press was one of the few who escaped. Unfortunately, he endured severe burns across his body and face, leaving scars and burn marks that serve as a constant reminder of that fateful day. Now let's bring in Joseph Spa, Commander Charles Rosendahl, overseeing operations at Lakehurst on the day of the Hindenburg disaster, expressed to the FBI his suspicion that the airship had been sabotaged. Now he had discussed that his concern with Hugo Eckner, the head of the Zeppelin company, despite publicly supporting that a spark had caused the disaster, Eckner confidentially confided in Rosendahl his belief that this was sabotage. And for good reason, right? I mean, if a spark had caused this massive fireball in the Hindenburg, who's to say that this wouldn't spark up concerns for the other airships? After interviewing the entire crew, Eckner discovered their suspicions about a passenger named Joseph Spa. According to a steward, Spa's behavior was quite unusual. Several members of the Hindenburg crew, including Chief Steward Heinrich Kubis, and Commander Max Press believed that Spa had committed sabotage on this ship. The airship crew thought Spa's participation in a sabotage scheme lay in his multiple unescorted trips to the aft cargo room to attend to his dog, Ula. And Ula tragically perished in the crash. It's very sad. I hate hearing about dogs suffering. These actions violated the ship's regulations and Spa was scolded for them by the chief steward on at least one occasion. The cargo room's proximity to the location of the aft part of the ship where the fire ignited led to some suspect that Spa had used his visits to his dog as a disguise to ascend into the ship's interior and place a bomb. Additional suspicion arose as several of the Hindenburg stewards allegedly observed unusual behavior in Spa. During the flight, he kept to himself, avoiding interactions with other passengers, and even voiced his disdain for airships along with making anti-Nazi remarks. He also became extremely eager to land when the thunderstorms postponed the ship's landing for several hours. Now, the crew supposed that he could have planted a bomb inside the Hindenburg during one of these covert visits. Rosendahl felt Spa may have sabotaged the ship. Joseph Spa was a circus performer by the name of Ben Dova. He was an acrobat, so he could have easily climbed into the rigging to place some kind of timer device to ignite a vented hydrogen gas in that area, right? If Spa had climbed the rigging to set a time trigger to release some kind of device, maybe he intended it to go off after the passengers had left the airship, including himself. Conceivably, that is why he was so eager to get off the ship during the delay. Now, Eric Spell. Spell was employed as a rigger and was one of the limited crew members with access to the ship's aft area. And remember, that was the area believed to be the explosion starting point. A piece of tangible evidence bolstering the sabotage theory was the discovery of a dry battery residue within the wreckage by the New York bomb squad. This battery type could have potentially powered a camera flash, feasibly used as a component on an incendiary device. The finding cast suspicion upon the crew member Eric Spell, known for his avid amateur photography and his access to similar batteries. Several explosion witnesses reported observing a bright flash at the explosion's origin. Engineer Rudolf Sauter even heard a noise that sounded like a camera flash going off. Allegations surfaced that Eric Spell had strategically placed a time bomb adjacent to one of the gas cells in the ship's aft section. In their minds, the intended detonation post-landing and in the presence of American reporters aimed to garner global attention for the German anti-Nazi resistance movement a group that Spell and his girlfriend were rumored to be affiliated with. A later investigation into Spell's history had uncovered a potential motive. 
it was discovered that his girlfriend in Germany was suspected of having communist leanings and had faced Gestapo interrogation for her anti-Nazi beliefs. It is possible that Spell intended to seek revenge on the Nazi regime by destroying the Hindenburg. Similarly to suspect Joseph Spa, Spell's objective may have been solely focused on destroying the Hindenburg without intending harm to any other passengers. Due to a 12 hour delay, it is hypothesized that Spell might have been able to retrieve the device in time to prevent its detonation before the ship's landing. So what do you think? Do you think the Hindenburg was brought down by sabotage? I don't know. Let's talk about the evidence against the suspects. Joseph Spa was considered a suspect by the Hindenburg crew members. He underwent an investigation by the FBI. Fortunately, no evidence linking him to any sabotage activities were found, since there was no clear motive for the attack and the allegations against Spa was solely based on circumstantial evidence. The FBI concluded their inquiry promptly due to insufficient evidence. The noticeable agitation Spa displayed upon hearing about the delayed landing of the ship could be easily explained by his prolonged separation from his family, and maybe he just wanted to get off that damn ship, right? Another individual, Eric Spell, was also suspected of being a saboteur, mainly because of the battery residue found in the wreckage. No traces of explosives or fire-causing devices were discovered in the debris. Like Spa, the accusations against Spell were just circumstantial evidence. No concrete connection to a real conspiracy. Contrary to Spa, who had lived the catastrophe and was deeply distressed by accusations of his involvement, Spell lost his life in the crash, leaving no opportunity to refute the claims against him. So let's talk about the spark. Both initial investigations concluded that the tragedy was likely caused by a spark igniting a hydrogen leak, a theory that is supported even today by most modern experts. In 2013, a new investigation was launched by a group of friendly aeronautical engineers at the Southwest Research Institute in Texas. To explore all of these suggested scenarios, they conducted tests using scale models of the Hindenburg. They carefully analyzed historical footage, and by doing so, they uncovered some truly fascinating new eyewitnesses. One such account came from Mark Heald, who was only eight years old at the time in 1937. Heald witnessed an explosion in a very unique way. He vividly remembered seeing a blue flame near the airship's rudder. That observation was strong. It supported the investigator's hypothesis. That blue light described was identified as St. Elmo's fire. Now, St. Elmo's fire is an electrostatic plasma phenomenon that occurs during thunderstorms. The turbulent weather conditions had caused a significant buildup of static electricity at the rear of the airship, which ultimately contributed to the tragic disaster. The Hindenburg lowered its mooring ropes. It anchored at Lankhurst, effectively grounding the airship. This likely caused sparking, which ignited a hydrogen leak. The leak has been said to have been caused by a sharp left turn made by the airship, resulting in a snapped internal wire. That wire could have easily struck one of the bags, causing a small leak. So when the spark came, the fire quickly spread through the ventilation shafts, igniting the hydrogen in the ship's 16 gas cells. In just 34 seconds, the entire ship was engulfed. This aligns closely with the known burn rate of hydrogen. While several theories have emerged, the initial investigations have proven to be accurate. The spark theory remains as the most consistent with the available evidence. But despite its untimely end, the Hindenburg was not inherently unsafe. However, the widespread broadcast of the devastation and fiery demise marked the definitive end of the golden era of airships. It's quite a disappointment, isn't it? blimps and similar aircraft are so fascinating, especially as a means of transportation. I would love to take an airship over the Atlantic. That would be so fun. Okay, now here's a fun fact. You guys know about the Goodyear blimp, right? Well, the Goodyear company and the Zeppelin company shared a close relationship, which commenced in October 1922. This collaboration began when Goodyear executive William C. Young traveled to Friedrichshafen, Germany, presenting a joint venture proposition with Hugo Eckner. By September 1923, the Goodyear Zeppelin Corporation was established, with Goodyear President 
Paul W. Lichfield emerging as a staunch advocate for rigid airships. The partnership thrived in the 1920s and 30s, leading Zeppelin captain Ernst Lehman, engineer Carl Arnstein, and other Zeppelin staff to relocate to Akron, Ohio. Their mission was to aid Goodyear Zeppelin Corporation in crafting airships utilizing Zeppelin Company's patents. This collaboration peaked with the construction of the Akron and Macon airships for the U.S. Navy in the early 1930s. However, due to the World War II in 1939, it strained the relationship, leading to the dissolution of the Goodyear Zeppelin Corporation in December 1940. But to this day, the Goodyear blimp flying around in Europe is operated by Zeppelin, and the remaining three airships operate out of the bases in the U.S. in Pompano Beach, Florida, Carson, California, and near Akron, Ohio, the home to the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. I actually went on the Goodyear blimp one time. It was really cool. Well, thanks for watching. Bye.